nine centuries of war had gradually introduced into the service many alterations and improvements. The legions, as they are described by Polybius in the time of the Punic Wars, differed very materially from those which achieved the victories of Caesar, or defended the monarchy of Hadrian and the Antonines. The constitution of the imperial legion may be described in a few words. The heavily armed infantry, which composed its principal strength, was divided into ten cohorts and fifty-five companies, under the orders of a correspondent number of tribunes and centurions. The first cohort, which always claimed the post of honour and the custody of the eagle, was formed of eleven hundred and five soldiers, the most approved for valour and fidelity. The remaining nine cohorts consisted each of five hundred and fifty-five and the whole body of legionary infantry amounted to six thousand one hundred men. Their arms were uniform, and admirably adapted to the nature of their service. An open helmet with a lofty crest, a breastplate or coat of mail, greaves on their legs, and an ample buckler on their left arm. The buckler was of an oblong and concave figure, four feet in length, and two and a half in breadth, framed of a light wood, covered with a bull's hide, and strongly guarded with plates of brass. Besides a lighter spear, the legionary soldier grasped in his right hand the formidable pylum, a ponderous javelin, whose utmost length was about six feet, and which was terminated by a massy triangular point of steel, of eighteen inches. This instrument was indeed much inferior to our modern firearms, since it was exhausted by a single discharge at the distance of only ten or twelve paces. Yet, when it was launched by a firm and skilful hand, there was not any cavalry that durst venture within its reach, nor any shield or corslet that could sustain the impetuosity of its weight. As soon as the Roman had darted his pylum, he drew his sword and rushed forwards to close with the enemy. His sword was a short, well-tempered Spanish blade that carried a double edge and was alike suited to the purpose of striking or of pushing. But the soldier was always instructed to prefer the latter use of his weapon, as his own body remained less exposed while he inflicted a more dangerous wound on his adversary. The legion was usually drawn up eight deep, and the regular distance of three feet was left between the files as well as ranks. A body of troops, habituated to preserve this open order in a long front and a rapid charge, found themselves prepared to execute every disposition which the circumstances of war or the skill of their leader might suggest. The soldier possessed a free space for his arms and motions, and sufficient intervals were allowed, through which seasonable reinforcements might be introduced, to the relief of the exhausted combatants. The tactics of the Greeks and Macedonians were formed on very different principles. The strength of the phalanx depended on sixteen ranks of long pikes, wedged together in the closest array. But it was soon discovered by reflection, as well as by the event, that the strength of the phalanx was unable to contend with the activity of the legion. The cavalry, without which the force of the legion would have remained imperfect, was divided into ten troops or squadrons. The first, as the companion of the first cohort, consisted of a hundred and thirty-two men, whilst each of the other nine amounted only to sixty-six. The entire establishment formed a regiment, if we may use the modern expression, of seven hundred and twenty-six horse, naturally connected with its respective legion, but occasionally separated to act in the line and to compose a part of the wings of the army. 
the cavalry of the emperors was no longer composed, like that of the ancient republic, of the noblest youths of Rome and Italy, who, by performing their military service on horseback, prepared themselves for the offices of senator and consul, and solicited by deeds of valour the future suffrages of their countrymen. Since the alteration of manners and government, the most wealthy of the equestrian order were engaged in the administration of justice and of the revenue, and whenever they embraced the profession of arms, they were immediately entrusted with a troop of horse or a cohort of foot. Trajan and Hadrian formed their cavalry from the same provinces, and the same class of their subjects, which recruited the ranks of the legion. The horses were bred for the most part in Spain or Cappadocia. The Roman troopers despised the complete armour with which the cavalry of the east was encumbered. Their more useful arms consisted in a helmet, an oblong shield, light boots, and a coat of mail. A javelin and a long broadsword were their principal weapons of offence. The use of lancers and of iron maces they seem to have borrowed from the barbarians. The safety and honour of the empire was principally entrusted to the legions, but the policy of Rome condescended to adopt every useful instrument of war. Considerable levies were regularly made among the provincials, who had not yet deserved the honourable distinction of Romans. Many dependent princes and communities, dispersed round the frontiers, were permitted for a while to hold their freedom and security by the tenure of military service. Even select troops of hostile barbarians were frequently compelled or persuaded to consume their dangerous valour in remote climates and for the benefit of the state. All these were included under the general name of auxiliaries, and howsoever they might vary according to the difference of times and circumstances, their numbers were seldom much inferior to those of the legions themselves. Among the auxiliaries, the bravest and most faithful bands were placed under the command of prefects and centurions, and severely trained in the arts of Roman discipline. But the far greater part retained those arms to which the nature of their country, or their early habits of life, more peculiarly adapted them. By this institution, each legion, to whom a certain proportion of auxiliaries was allotted, contained within itself every species of lighter troops, and of missile weapons, and was capable of encountering every nation with the advantages of its respective arms and discipline. Nor was the legion destitute of what, in modern language, would be styled a train of artillery. It consisted in ten military engines of the largest, and fifty-five of a smaller size, but all of which, either in an oblique or horizontal manner, discharged stones and darts with irresistible violence. <laughs> 